All right, so I have one door in my shop and I want to replace that. And my thought is I don't only have so many windows, why not add another window into my door? I wanted to go with a half window with blinds inside. This is my good friend, Mark Bates. If you are in Searcy, Arkansas, he's Mark Bates Contracting. He works for Lowe's, installs doors and windows, mm -hmm. uh, general all around handyman. Mm -hmm. So he's the pro, he's gonna be replacing the door. So I come to you and mm -hmm. I say, I need a door and I want half blind inside the window. What's the next step to replace this? So the first thing I'm gonna do is measure your door and make sure that what you need is in stock. So first measurement, basically if you've got that, this is three, um, 356 trim. It's just casing, colonial casing basically. Uh, I'm generally measuring from this first ridge in the trim because this is three quarter board right here on the jam. This is three quarter inches. So I'm just make believing that I can see through it and measuring from there to the same thing over here. So it's almost like the first ridge yeah, in that the, trim. The first ridge in that casing. Now if you have 324, which is the exact same shape, but it doesn't have the ridges, you just kind of have to assume this is a three quarter inch board. So I'm gonna put the end of my tape right here against this ridge and look at the tape on that other end. And it's 37 and a half, which is a standard door. The door itself is the 36 inch door. So this is a, this is a standard 3-0, 36 inch door, which means that the unit is 37 and a half. That means that your opening is generally about 38 inches. On the height, the height is a little bit trickier because you have to contend with uh, whatever flooring you have. And then a lot of older doors have weird thresholds and whatnot. So there's a little bit of guesswork when it comes to the height. On this one, there's not because it's a shop and it's real simple. 82 is the height that you're looking for for standard in stock doors as far as the opening is concerned. Right here you can see that from the concrete to the basically that little groove and the trim right there is 82. On the inside of your house, you're almost never going to land right there. It's going to look like the door is shorter. Um, and you just kind of, sometimes you may have to pop that top trim off just to be sure that you've got about 81 and three quarter inches of space for the new door. If you don't have 81 and three quarter inches, you're going to struggle. So, but this one's going to work fine. So the third measurement that you want is the jam size. And this is determined by whether or not you've got four inch studs or six inch studs in your house, plus all of the custom trim that may or may not be there. All you're doing is measuring the thickness of this jam right here. Standard is four and nine sixteenths, which is what this is. That's one notch over four and a half. And uh, if you have six inch walls, you're gonna have six and nine sixteenths. There could be anything in between. This one happens to be a standard door, so it's four and nine sixteenths. So we'll move forward from there. The last thing that I'm generally gonna do if I'm measuring a door is determine the swing. The way that you determine the swing is you put your back to the hinges, you stand in the doorway, put your back in the hinges. The hand that operates the door, that's the swing. This is a left hand in swing door. The last thing that I'm gonna determine when I'm measuring a door is this exterior trim. Uh, most doors come with brick mold, and when we pull the door that Ben got out, we'll see that it's got brick mold on it. Because this doesn't have brick mold, we'll have to knock that brick mold off and install this behind here. This is an aluminum wrap on top of what I assume is a 2x4 by the size of it. It might be a little bit bigger than a 2x4. And because he's got an aluminum wrap, he's going to want to keep that because there's no roof over here or anything. This is protecting the wood. So we're gonna to have to take this off. The aluminum's gonna get destroyed in this case, but we can reuse the wood, put the door in, insulate it, and then we're gonna to have to rebuild that aluminum and install it after the door is complete. This is the door that Ben picked up. It's got the blinds and the glass, which is a great feature. I wanna talk uh, for just a second about what to look for when you're in the store and you're trying to buy a door. These doors in the big box stores have a tendency to take a lot of beating they take a lot of damage. Uh, not everybody's real careful with them. So there's a couple of things to look for while you're there. On the, uh, the exterior of the door, which is this side, you're gonna, uh, this is a steel door, and steel doors have a tendency to dent and scratch real bad. 
the exteriors are usually a little bit uh, more protected because they've got the width of the jam in there. But like on the interior, which is the interior side of the door, you'll start to see little dings. You see a little place, that's where the cart hit it. And then there's a little, there's a little dent that the camera's probably not gonna pick up right there, but I can feel it with my finger. Um, that's just probably from another door's hinges being right up against it. And that's, these are just the things you're gonna look for on these uh, blinds in the glass doors. You also kinda wanna check out to make sure this hasn't gotten knocked off. This is a series of magnets that connects to a series of magnets in here. And they click to one another and this can just get knocked off really easily. Uh, you can just put it back on and pop it out, but you wanna make sure you walk, uh, you wanna make sure you walk out the store with this piece. Uh, one of the other things to check on is every once in a while they'll send one of these staples through the door because they're in such a hurry to build the door that they uh, just kind of shoot a little too fast. Um, so I've got one that's kind of low right here, but the door is way back here. So there's actually a pretty decent chance that that staple's popping out. No, it's not. So it's good. But you just kind of want to check your top corners. You don't want staples to be... Uh, sticking out of the door. If you have a choice between three doors, you're gonna get the one that doesn't have a staple sticking out through it. And then the last thing that you're gonna look for is here on the hinge side, this crack right here, every once in a while, they will hang a door way too high or way too low so that uh, like it's just not gonna seal as good as it could if you've got a good, um, a good gap right here. This gap doesn't matter because this is just kind of stuck in there. It's not set yet but the gap on the hinge side is really important up here to make sure that you've got a, a gap that you want. Quarter inch is probably a little big and an eighth inch is probably a little small. This right here, we're at about a, an eighth to a three sixteenth. So that means that this door is hanging a little high on the frame, but it's, it's gonna seal fine. All right, Ben said that we're gonna, he's got a new hardware set, but I'll go ahead and take this one off. Uh, just so that you can see how easy it is to take off and put on a new hardware set. There's really only about eight screws that holds these things together. It's uh, the two, two screws here and two screws here in the receivers. And then there's the screws that hold this handle. Sometimes this will stick, you just push that in to get it out. And then I'll, I'll kind of hold both sides. Oop. And then if it's uh, sticking a little, you can always tap it with your expensive drill. And those will pop right out. First thing I'm going to do when I'm uh, messing with these doors is I'm going to go ahead and take the door off the hinges. Generally, I'm going to do it in a shop like this. I don't necessarily need to do that. But in your house, I would do it because it makes it a lot easier for me not to bang, like to hit your exterior trim, your interior trim, to mess up your floor if I pull the, the door off the hinges first. There's also a solid chance that... Uh, they used a long screw to install this to the studs. So taking these out also ensures that you're taking those screws out as well. As opposed to popping the hinges. If I were in your house, I'd put something under the door right now. Since I'm not in a house and this is just a concrete floor, I'm not really worried about it. I'm just gonna put my foot down here. Oh, dude, I got two long screws up here. Last thing on the tear out as far as the handle set is concerned, don't forget to take off your strike plates, especially if you're gonna use them again. All right, now it's time to take off the interior trim. 
If I were inside your house doing your front door, I would use a cat claw, just a real small bar to get behind here and uh, keep from messing up your sheetrock or whatever interior paneling you have or, or, and all that stuff. We're in a shop, it doesn't really matter. Uh, as well as the fact that he's got a, uh, he's kind of got a gap right here. So if I see a gap, I'm just gonna get into that gap. Did you buy new trim? Hmm. Okay, so this has to come off without breaking because he's gonna reuse it. So what you're gonna do is you're not, you really don't wanna use, pry it all the way off in one spot. You're gonna pry a little bit there. You're gonna get as close to whatever's holding it as possible and then pry a little bit there and a little bit there and kind of take it, try to keep it straight the whole time you're trying to pry it off. And then you have a better chance of keeping it from breaking. One um, thing I noticed you doing, I'm gonna step in as a very novice of this, is using this, I mean, it's something so simple. When I see this bar, I think it has to pull this way mm -hmm. and you dropped it to the side and made that look easy. So that's something a homeowner may not know. I didn't know. Yeah, and a lot of times, if you have some of this that's sticking, like a, a, especially if you have a thinner type, like not, not all trim is 356. So if you've got one of the thinner, I can't remember what the numbers are of it, but the fancier stuff or whatever, or a trailer, if you're in a trailer, then it's real flimsy. Um, you kind of have to bounce the bar a little bit and like kind of, now this, this is coming out so easy, so it's hard to show. But, the, uh, but you kind of have to bounce it, bounce it, bounce it, and then the thing will, will come off real gently. So we'll go ahead and take these off real quick. When you get the top, a lot of times there's a nail through the corner here, and you're gonna wanna kinda lever it. This one didn't have a nail through the corner. But if you try to pull it off this way, it'll crack the trim and you're not gonna be able to save it. And I'm starting here, like once I've got a starting space, you don't see this. So where I'm prying, I'm prying in the place where your eye is not gonna see it. So if I bend it up a little bit back there, it's not hurting anything. And if we're gonna reuse this trim, what I'll do, a lot of folks will try to bang these nails out. Uh, that usually creates a mess on the front of the board because if the nails countersunk, it's actually gonna make the board kind of explode outward. So I take a pair of uh, nibblers. These are uh, tile nibblers. And I just grab the nail and lever it through. And in the, front, the face of the board might have a hole and in some cases it won't even have a hole. These are tile nibblers, but uh, there's a thing called nail pullers that looks exactly the same. The only thing that is different with the tile nibblers is that the, um, these actually have a tendency to cut the nail a little too, like they're, they're beefy. So the next thing I'm gonna look for is, uh, basically I'm gonna look around here and behind this weather stripping to see if there's any screws. Screws are just harder, like if there's a nail, I can kind of pull that out or I could cut it, but screws are a lot harder to cut and I'd rather just unscrew them. So I see a screw here, a screw here. Of course it's a square head, which is not what's in my drill. Um, and I don't, the screws on this side were probably going through the hinge, so I don't really see any other screws. So I need to find a square head bit to get those out. Then we'll start removing the frame. So are you looking for screws when you do this? Uh, yeah, I'm looking for all the fasteners. I'm just trying to trying to get a feel for what I'm looking at because having a clean tear out allows for the install to go a lot smoother. So since I want to preserve my exterior trim, I'm going to try to kind of gently pull this back from that trim so I'm not beating that trim up. I know that I'm gonna have to replace this aluminum, so I don't care if I have to beat that up, but I wanna preserve the wood behind it. Oh, 
But what I'm doing is just kind of making a gap. And as I do this, I'll sort of get a feel as to how this door is going to want to come out. Some doors, like if your builder just kind of nailed the door in with the brick mold, which a lot of builders do, they just pop it in there and pop, 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 pop with the nails and they walk away. If your door doesn't work right and you have a new house, that's probably what they did. The, uh, this door will basically fall right out as soon as you do this step. In this case, they didn't do that. They put a, a few more fasteners into it, but this is still coming out. Now his, his bottom's rotten. Normally the bottom wouldn't come off like that, but the bottom's uh, rotten and it had some termite damage in it. So. so that's coming right out. And because this is what released, I'm gonna try to manipulate that a little bit. Then what I'm gonna do, since we decided to keep this, which is, it happens from time to time. Uh, instead of taking this all the way off, I'm actually just gonna cut these nails as flush to the exterior trim as I can, and then this door will just come right out, and the new door can come right in and just set against that exterior trim. All right, so I'm gonna cut these nails cleanly. I'm gonna take my wood blade out and put my metal blade in, I'm gonna put it in upside down so I can get the saw a little bit closer this way. I don't have this thing getting in the way. One thing you do want to make sure is if, if this is your front door and you're doing that, don't cut the doorbell wire. <laughs> Ask me how I know. <laughs> oh, I've never done it. <laughs> so we're a little tight up top. Got a special tool for that. is I will go ahead and get all this off. What is that? It's caulk. Ah, uh, the caulk on the bottom. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of older doors don't have this, but the, uh, because this door isn't really covered by anything, they sealed the bottom. If you've got a porch or something over your door, you don't just absolutely have to do that, but. All right, <clears throat> so in this case, we are gonna just leave this exterior trim alone. We don't have to use it, so um, that means we have to take this brick mold off. And we'll go ahead and do that. We'll go ahead and do the unpacking too. They like to send uh, pieces of cardboard and junk that are stapled into the outside. Really the best way, there's not a great way to take this stuff off. About the best way is to take your pry bar and just kind of jack into it. You're not gonna hurt the door on this side of it, so. A lot of times there's some hardware that comes with your door. These little wedges that are down here, they're invaluable, so make sure you hold on to those. Now it doesn't seem like it, but uh, prying this brick mold off is a lot of times not the best way to take it off in order to preserve your door as much as you can because prying on it has a tendency to leave dents in the door. And so it's actually better to do the more violent thing, which is to beat it off as long as you beat it from the back. Start at the bottom because there's less holding it on. 
just kind of You got it? Mm -hmm. There. Now I'll check around here for staples. I don't have any. You want to hold the door? Oh, okay, yep. you got that. I'll get this. You hold the door. I got it. Not reusing this part, right? Nope. Uh, this was a unique time when there weren't any staples in here. Most of the time there are still staples left over because that pulled through and you just use your tile nippers or whatever to pull those staples out. All right, now we're going to seal the bottom. I'm using black silicone. I try to generally use silicone if I can. What's and the difference in using silicon, <clears throat> silicon, silicone? Silicone, silicone. Well, you say it weird. Is, um, <laughs> Well, there's latex caulk, which is paintable, and then there's silicon, which isn't. Okay. And silicon, but silicon has a lot more elasticity, so it, it lasts way better over time. Is what's what's cheaper, silicone or the paintable? Uh, paintable is almost always cheaper, depending on color and all that stuff. Paintable is almost always cheaper, but on the exterior of your house, you really don't want to use paintable if you can help it. I'm using black, but that's just because that's what's loaded in the caulk gun. It's going to be under the door, so it doesn't matter what color. Now your, your door thresholds have several different designs. A lot of times they're kind of honeycombed up under here. A lot of times this under here isn't flat. It's like some kind of a honeycomb kind of a thing. In which case, a line of caulk isn't going to work on the honeycomb part. So you really need to feel up under your door. I just kind of knew that this one was flat. But uh, if you just feel up under it, you want to feel the flat part and make sure that you're putting the caulk where the flat part is. What's the best application if it's honeycomb? Well, there's, there's going to be a flat part somewhere. You just kind of have to figure out where it is in there and make sure you get the caulk on that part. Can you over caulk that? Uh, if you don't want to make a mess. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it'll, it'll seal fine. You just, uh, you know, the more caulk you put in, the more it's going to squish out. And if you're doing your front door, where you actually like, you know, you got a nice hardwood floor or something, it, you, you'll make a bad mess. And if you're really scared about your floor, I'd suggest using clear caulk. So now I'm going to set the door in there, maybe, that's tight, but first you've got to take out this little thing that holds the, holds the door closed. You just kind of turn it a quarter turn, it's actually pretty hard to turn. Pop that out of there. And now you can set this in. I'm keeping the door leaned back so that I can slide it forward without messing with the caulk because once I lean forward, now it's pushing caulk and it's going to start making a mess. So how do you know how far in you need to put the door jam? Is it well, well, in we this, know, in in this case, case, it's easy because I've got trim out there that's holding out. it. Uh, what I'm, what I'm going to do if I didn't have that exterior, now, in this particular case, because the walls work out perfectly, if I didn't have that exterior, I'd be using the brick mold and I'd be putting it in from the outside. But if I didn't have anything to use, which happens 50% oh, of the time, where you just have to set the door and then trim the inside and then trim the outside, uh, I'm, I'm going to try to get flush with the inside because that's the best looking option. This one, it's the only option. So I'm going to go flush with the inside. What I'm going to do is open the door and then just lean it, lean it on the door. The door holds itself open. And then as I'm setting this, what I'm going to do 
is find something to put under this door while it's open. And I'm just gonna throw some shims under there so that I don't have to hold this because I usually do it by myself. So these are just scraps of wood. Yeah, that are cutting the wedges. Just holding the door straight up, just yep. giving you a third hand basically. That's, that's it. There we go. So it's just sitting in there. You really don't want to over shim it because it's going to kick the bottom back. You don't want to under shim it because then the top will be back. You just want to put the right amount of shims in there so that you're flush from bottom to top on this side back wall. Is there ever a time when you're going to put a door in where, let's say the, the bottom is not straight. Like right now we're assuming the concrete is flat. We are you know assuming I mean? that, yes. Yeah. And then it, you know everything else is maybe yes. not straight. Is there ever a time where you shim underneath or anything super like that? Super common. Um, it's super common for the opening to be out of square. It's a really good question because it's, um, it's where you have to sort of give and take. You gotta figure out what's most important to you when it comes to shimming the door. Now the door has to be installed square or it's not gonna work. And it also can't have a twist. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But the, uh, as far as the bottom is concerned, it's my priority to make sure that that bottom seals because that bottom's gonna get way more weather than any other part of the door. Especially right here where there's no overhead. Exactly. So yeah. I'm gonna, if this concrete does happen to be at a level, I'm gonna do everything I can not to shim up that, which means that if I have to install the door a little leaning left or leaning right or something to allow that to happen, I'm willing to do that because I want the weather seal. And our molding will cover up yeah, the yeah. Out square. You won't really notice it. The only maybe just the straight lines in the door or the window. Right. You may well, notice. in this case, you wouldn't notice it at all. So, if you had a house that had a lot of up and down, like if you have uh, uh, paneling that has those yeah. lines up and down, and right. your doors installed like way off to the left, that's that's when you'll notice it. But most drywall houses, you won't notice it. Even if you have to twist a little the door a little bit to get it to work right, you generally don't. The eye generally doesn't pick that up. Okay. I am noticing one thing on the outside. Let me bring the camera. We gave this aluminum and mm -hmm. we pushed out the aluminum down on the bottom. Yep. How do we correct well, that? Look what you got over here. Oh, we got plenty on this you side. You got a, a, plenty of space, so we're just going to move the door a little bit. A little bit over and that just kind of tuck that aluminum back there. Perfect. I always use, now these doors come with screws they, they, in that little packet of stuff. They had three silver screws. And if you want to use the silver screws, then bless you for that. But I, uh, I like to use longer treated screws. These are exterior screws that are coated so they don't ever rust or anything. And, uh, and they're three inches long, so they have a little bit better bite than those. So when I'm putting in these screws, most of these doors, this one's actually done well, which is cool. But most of these doors will have either this or this screw taken out, the, the ones closest to the outside of the door. Um, those are not the right screws to put this in because if you have a sheetrock house, this is way too close to your screw is actually gonna go into the sheetrock instead of going into the stud. Um, so if, if this screw was the one that was revealed or this one, you just pull that, you just pull the screw out from here and put it in here and then this is the hole that we want to go in. So the hole closest to the center of that. Yeah, the, ho the hole closest to the exterior mm -hmm. is what you want. And I'm basically gonna, now my, my shims are pushing the door out this way for me and I'm, I'm against the exterior trim so I know I'm in a good spot. But if you didn't have the exterior trim, you'd really be looking behind this door right here to make sure that the back of your jam is flush with your wall. And I almost always start with the top hinge and then go to the bottom hinge and we'll move on from there. I'm basically just gonna screw in until I'm touching the hinge, but I'm not gonna try to really pull the door back because I know I'm gonna have to adjust in a little bit. Then I'm gonna come down here and do the same thing. I'm gonna try to keep the door flush. Like in this case, the door is actually pushing out a little too far. And so there's, um, I, what I need to do is get the door in. And to do that, I'm gonna put another shim under here.
A little too much. Yeah, a little too much, Shannon. And this is the, the part of the install that you really need to take your time on. It's the part that either, you know, your, your door is either going to seal because it's installed correctly or you're going to, it's just going to make you mad for the next 10 years because it wasn't. So if you need to take a little extra time to move it, do it three or four times, that's the way to go. And that definitely did not feel like it went into anything solid. It's probably where the termite damage is. That would be my guess. I'm going to keep that where it is. And then I'll put a second anchor in it once we're all squared out. So now that, now that we've got two screws in this side, top and a bottom, we're going to come over here. I'm going to countersink three spots for screws over here. And then I'll put one of these screws in and we'll go from there. I'm going to countersink by using a 3 8 inch drill bit <clears throat> and just drilling in only about an eighth of an inch. Basically just so the head of the screw goes in but doesn't crack the jam. <clears throat> and I put my screws on the strike side <clears throat> underneath this weather seal. Go about six inches down, about eight in an eighth inch deep. This you have to be careful, there's a plate right here where the, uh, from where my fingers are for the deadbolt, so you want to be below that plate. You don't want to send that screw through that plate. About six inches up from the bottom, give or take. That was about five, but six inches would be actually kind of high. You really have to make sure you don't have any twist in your walls. Normally what I would do is put a screw in at the bottom and then pull this too and just kind of compare it here. And I'll do that in a little bit. In this case, because just kind of the makeup of this hole, I'm going to go ahead and close the door before I put the bottom screw in because that might be the thing that I need to kick out. Yeah. It totally is. So <clears throat> I know based on what I saw that this wall is out of whack a little bit. So I'm going to install the top of this out as far as I can. And you saw me just kind of bang out just a little bit. So there's a little bit of a gap. Now I know why that trim had a little bit of a gap there when I took it out. And I'll put my screw in here. and hold that to the outside trim. So what, um, what we're looking to do is make sure that this isn't twisted. And it doesn't matter if it's twisted with the house. It needs to not be twisted with itself or it won't seal right. So I'm going to take the bottom screw here and I'm going to put it in just a little bit. And then what I'm going to do is close this door, but not all the way. Now I'm going to close it so I see a little crack of daylight all the way up and down. And I want that crack to be the same size all the way down. So for me, it's easier if I, if I close that crack down to where it's the smallest possible point and then I can kind of move, since this is the one corner that's not screwed in, I can move it out or in as much as I need to to make sure that that's going to be the same. Right now it's looking pretty good. But it's actually in on the inside. And once I do that, I'll test it, see what it looks like when it's completely closed. And that's what you want to see. And these differences here we can fix later. So we've got screws in the four corners now. 
Uh, now we want the door to sit this way correctly. And we want to go ahead and shim it out before we put in the two middle screws. There's no reason to put those in because we just have to take them out if we have to move anything. So I'm going to close the door. I'm going to kind of take a look at the top and I'm going to look at the side. Now these doors are all hung differently depending on how they came out of the factory or who was building them that day. So sometimes this gap is real tiny, sometimes the gap is real big. What you really want to do is you, you have a little bit of control over that, but not a whole bunch. Um, as long as it looks relatively healthy, which this one does, then you're going to basically try to match that this gap right here, the gap between the jam and the door all the way down. It looks good now, but once we put some screws in it and we put some shims in it, it's going to change and we just have to go with that change. Uh, one other thing you want to look at is this top. We've got a bigger gap here than we have here. That's actually pretty normal. Um, if you installed this door where the gap was the same all the way across, there's a really solid chance that that bottom would not seal correctly because this just wouldn't touch the bottom seal. Uh, so the ba you, you kind of want it similar, but if it drops down just a little bit, it's okay because you'd rather, again, have the seal at the bottom be connecting more so than at the top. And it, it, it's, it's gonna seal fine up here. This one might actually work though, to where I can put that the same across the top. I'm not sure. But I'm kind of, I can feel the threshold is kind of rubbing on this side. So that means that this part of the door can actually go up. And the way I'm going to do that is by putting a shim behind this hinge and it's going to rotate the door this way. So if the door swings open on its own and it's not a windy day, we have not hung it correctly. Yeah. Yeah. If it, uh, now there's several reasons why it could do this right now. It's really windy. Yeah. Uh, generally, if it swings open on its own, it means that the top is leaning in and that'll make it swing in. Now, sometimes you need to install it that way. If your walls are leaning, it's better to go ahead and install your door leaning. I'm sure there's people that would argue that point, but I don't think they're right. <laughs> it's the difference between a builder and a remodeler. So the shims have a skinny side and a fat side, yes. and you're basically sticking it in. Now, the, the way the shims work, and in this case I'm not going, I really don't want <clears throat> this jam to be angled out. If it's got to be angled anyway, it needs to be angled in this way, to where the hinge is maybe slightly bent this way. If the hinge is angled out for any reason, like if you shim the front too much, or sometimes, a lot of times, your stud right here is twisted for some reason. Uh, it happens with the lumber that we have these days. The, uh, you really want to shim basically where it's bigger out here and smaller on the front, and that will allow your door to close smoothly. Another reason why the doors will open on their own is because the, the hinge is installed kind of out like that and the, the, it's the jam itself kind of popping the door open. It's one of those subtle things that'll give you a headache if you have no idea why your door keeps opening because you put a level on it and you're like, I don't know what's going on. It's because your jam is kind of wonked to the outside. Yep, I made up that word. So we're looking good here. I like that. We brought that up a little bit. Now before I feel good about it, I'm just going to get down on my knees and check this weather seal. I don't see any daylight under there. So I'm happy with that. So this I'm happy with. What I'm going to try to do is kind of tightening down that screw. What I'm going to try to do is just one by one do each corner in order. I'm going to do this lower corner, this upper corner, and then go down this side and just get each corner exactly where I want it. And as long as this one's right, 
this one's going to be right. If you don't do this one first and you do something over here first, well, then you're going to end up having to do the whole thing over again because everything depends on it in this order. Really, in this order. That's, yeah, a lot of folks will just try to stick something in there. A lot of, you'll see a lot of builders use uh, roofing shingles and stuff like that. One of the things that makes this a little bit easier, if you actually buy the shims or if you make shims that are wedged like that, is that if you put two shims together, they're adjustable. You can make a small shim that way or you can make a big shim by pushing them closer to the fat side. So they stay flat, but it makes it a little bit easier to adjust. I'm just looking at my looking at my gap. I do like these to be good and good and firm in there. I'm seeing uh, see this gap is a little bit bigger here than down there. And then as I'm looking over here, this is kind of tight. So what I want to do is just kind of move this whole headpiece that way a hair. So I need more shim here. Yeah, to get quite a bit smaller. I don't want it too small because doors expand and contract. And when it's real wet outside, especially here in Arkansas, uh, these doors will swell up so much that if a door is installed too tight, it just won't even open. Or you'll have to fight it to open it. We don't want that. I'm happy with my four corners. I'll screw this in just a hair. Hope that that doesn't change anything. Last thing I'm gonna do is double check this. Yeah. I don't see any daylight there. So once I get my four corners all done, now I can move forward and do the sides. Do one final check for the twist. Usually, by the time you get to the sides, it's real easy. And you just kinda wanna stick something in the hole that's already there. Cause you've pretty much got your, got your door where you want it, so the goal for the sides is not to screw it up. And you can, if you wedge something in there real tight, you could have to redo the whole thing. But as long as you're conscientious of that, the sides go pretty quick. And then you can move on. When you put your screw in, when it first makes contact with the wood, it will make a bigger gap and sometimes your shims fall out. Ooh, too much. good. What I'm doing right now is kind of listening for that to brush down there. If that's brushing down there, I might not need to get on my knees to check that. But I can hear that it's making contact, so I'm happy with that weather seal. A 
lot of times this strike area, you'll install that based on what kind of hardware you have. If you get one of those hardware sets that have the real thick strike plate, then you may want to do this whole side with a little bit more room so that that plate has space to sit there um, and not hit the door. It is, I don't know why, Quickset and I believe Schlage both sell those lock sets that have the real thick strike plate and then they also have a trim plate on in front of that strike plate that you really need a hand router and all of that stuff to get that stuff in there to where it works perfectly and very few people actually have the hand router. But if you just have the normal stuff, you should be able to just, this is about as small as you'd ever want your crack to be. And then it, I'm, I'm actually gonna make it a little bit bigger to make it easier to get the plate on there. This is the plate we're going with here. Quick set, power bolt to touch pad keyless entry for the shop. You had to do the touch pad. I have to do the touch pad. Electronics. So many people come over to the shop that at all weird times of the day. It's like cheers. Mm-hmm. Norm. Oh. Don't close your door on a drill bit. I'd like a little more space. If you, especially if you're gonna pull that touch pad business. And uh, shims will just score it, snap it off. Doorknob's very easy to put on. We're putting on the old one temporarily here, especially because the wind is blowing the door over open. You just slide that piece in. Put a couple of these short, short screws in. Okay, so just in case you accidentally close the door while this is in there and you can't get it open. All you have to do is put the knob in there, twist it, and it'll come open. <clears throat> Just in case anybody was in fact on it, nobody here was dumb enough to do that, but in case somebody at home is. Doesn't really matter if it's upside down or right side up. There's really no, it just depends on, some of the locks do have it to where they both sit in the same position. But most of them, most of the ones that are like in the low to medium price range are just still this lock. It just depends on if it's a left swing door or right swing door, whether or not this is gonna be upside down or right side up. If you use a long bit that doesn't have a sleeve on it, you're gonna mark up your deal here. You need to have something to protect, to protect the side of your handle if you're gonna use a drill or you can just use a hand screwdriver. So you put the door knobs in before you put the strike plate on the door. Yes. Yeah. And that's on purpose. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, the strike plate takes a little adjustment and that's where it's the easiest thing because it's two screws but it's also the easiest thing to screw up your door because the, the strike plate has everything to do with the seal all right now this is a fancy knob with electric and stuff so i may have to read the instructions This part goes in the way all the others do. 
So since Mr. Ben wanted to have a fancy lock set, we'll go ahead and do that. We're gonna put this in with the wire. This is the exterior assembly with the buttons. Go ahead and put this in with the wire underneath the dealio right here. And this should be flat. And then you wanna go ahead and give that a test. And you're gonna do this. If you look at this sideways, you want this to be sticking out, not in. And you're gonna run the wire through this bottom, the bottom of the plate. Trying to get it in there. And we'll take our two gold screws, send them all the way through. One of the keys to doing these is making sure that these screws go in fairly smoothly. If it doesn't go in smoothly, don't try to force it because you will screw up your lock. Most of the instructions say to just use a screwdriver instead of a drill just to keep you from screwing it up. All right. So then take this, I've already taken the battery deal off. Twist this so that it's all the way away from the edge of the door here. So it's going that way. And you can go ahead and hook these guys up, red to red. Hear the click. And then just slide that on there. And then you got two holes here where the metal receiver pieces are. I'll take these. Screw them down so that they're firm, but not over tight. Give her a test. And then you can read the instructions to learn how to do the code and the batteries and all of that. So putting the strike plate on this little plate for the handle is very important that you get it right uh, because it really controls how the door feels when it closes. So you can't just kind of like slap it on there and think it's going to work right. There's this much play in here once this gets into that hole. And this distance is the amount of distance that it takes to screw up your entire door installation. So. You just have to really be sure that you've got this where you want it. And then once you get that first hole in there, it becomes fairly difficult to do it again if you don't have that hole exactly where you want it. So what I do is I close the door and I kind of feel where it should be. Once the door is closed, kind of like where the door sits in this hole. And then I try to install that first screw similarly. I sort of do it by feel. So in this case, it feels like this door can really, this can be installed pretty far out. And one thing that you do have is if you, if you install it a little bit too far this way, you can always take this little tang right here and you can always bend it in and that'll make your door close a little bit tighter. Hopefully we won't have to do that. I'm going to install one screw first, make sure it's going to work. I'm going to close the door and try the deadbolt to make sure the deadbolt's going to fall in that hole. It's operating completely smoothly. So now I'm going to put this second screw in and I'm going to take a lot of effort to make sure that it goes in the middle of the hole, not on one side. Because if it goes on the front or the back, it's going to move this whole thing forward or backward. Test it again. Okay. So 
So that's good. We've got one of these larger strike plates for whatever reason. They like to make the strike plates larger than the router position. Because uh, it's awesome. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to close this door and I'm just going to kind of run this strike plate up and down in here to see if I have clearance. If I have clearance, I'm not going to worry about routering in there. I'm just going to install that strike plate right on top of that hole and it'll do the job the way it needs to. Yep, I've got plenty of clearance. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to close the door all the way. I'm going to set the deadbolt and I'm going to basically do the same thing I did here where I, I'm going to turn this handle and just kind of feel how much space I have to get a feel for whether or not this should be on kind of the front of the hole or the back of the hole or where that needs to be. So on this one, there is actually quite a bit. When I turn this handle and this is engaged, it moves back a lot. So that means that the hole needs to be quite a bit this way. Probably need to hug the front of this. I'll just put one of these small screws in. When you install these strike plates, you've got two big holes and two small holes. These are the security holes. These are the not security holes. You put the not security holes towards the inside of your house because if you did it the other way, you'd have your security screws going into your drywall. The security screws, screws are longer. Yeah, longer and stud. beefier. And you definitely need to pre-drill the security screws. I'm gonna kinda The moral of the story is that you're testing everything while it's still easy to change. If you put all four screws in there and then found out that it didn't work, you'd already have holes drilled and it would make the job a whole lot harder. So every single time I put something in, I'm testing it. For the first security screw that goes in here, you've got to be very aware that this is going to bite so much that it could pull this jam back quite a bit. So you just want to get it flush with the plate, maybe pull the plate in just a hair and then let it be. And then test it. Like a glove. Pull that out just a hair. Because I pulled that jam in just a little too much. Yep. And there you go. Now we just need to install the interior trim and seal the exterior trim. All right, next. You're going to insulate. Yeah, Ben already had a strip of insulation here from insulating the rest of the shop. So we'll just use this. Uh, normally I would take a thing of insulation and cut it into about a three and a half inch uh, width. And then I'd peel off bits about like that. If this is what I'm trying to insulate, then I want about that thick. 
I don't want to stuff it in there too tight because you lose your insulative properties. But I kind of want to sort of grab it and kind of push it to the back, but to where it's still just barely in there. I mean, uh, it's not in there really tight. You're basically just grabbing the side of it and pushing it to where it's still, it still has the air pockets that it's supposed to have. It's actually working pretty good. Uh, it's easier to do that when you have more space and then you'll just gear how much you put in there by the space. So I'm gonna get just a little bit, a little bit thicker piece for the top here, but do the same thing where I kind of grab part of it and push it to the back. Try not to smash it in there too hard. And if you smash it in there hard, if it gets all bunched up, it'll still insulate. It just won't do what it would if it's, you know, if it's put in there correctly. Some gaps aren't worth worrying about. There are two too small, you could caulk them if you really cared. But once you're getting below an eighth of an inch, I mean, it's getting real hard to get anything in there that's gonna do any good. You're right here, down here, it's so skinny. I can't get, I wouldn't be able to get anything in there. I don't use the spray foam on these unless there is a, a greater chance on the exterior of there being leakage. If there is a really good chance that the exterior is gonna leak, then the spray foam can kind of provide a seal for that leak. But in most homes, spray foam is just a liability when it comes to the mess that it makes. And you also can't control how much it expands. I've opened up an awful lot of doors that had spray foam in the old doorway and there's just a single line of spray foam that never expanded. And you, if, you, if, a, if a product is that unpredictable, then I'd rather just use something that I have control over and I don't have to clean up. And if you read the spray foam can, it'll tell you, if you don't clean it up before it cures, there's nothing that cleans it up. I am using a DeWalt um, battery powered gun. Uh, this has saved me an awful lot of uh, setting up and cleaning up of the compressor. And that's an 18 gauge Brad nailer? Yes, I believe so. Yes, that's what it says on the side. <laughs> I'm gonna set this up so the bottom of this is, a, is off of here. You know what, actually before I do that, I need to, sometimes your new door isn't the same size as your old door. And you need to take your top piece and just kind of put it on there and see how it lies. This one's gonna fit exactly the way it fit on the old one, so that's cool. A lot of times it won't, especially depending on what kind of door came out. <clears throat> a lot of the doors in stock are the same, but the doors on your house probably aren't. So I'm about a quarter, I'm leaving a quarter inch reveal right here and trying to give myself a quarter inch reveal on top as well. I'm gonna stay about six inches away. I'm gonna pop one, one right there. And one right there, just so that I have so little in there that I can, I can adjust it if I need to.
that looks like that's working good. So now I can go all the way around. You want to turn on the fire through here, or through here, where these specs go through? No, I've never done that. Now, if we were going to replace the exterior, we would go and do the exterior trim the same way we just did the interior trim. But since we're not replacing the exterior, all we're going to do, and the door is firmly in there, so we don't really have to attach the exterior trim. If, uh, if I wasn't trying to save that aluminum, I'd go ahead and run some screws through the exterior trim into this door. But since we want to preserve that aluminum, we, all we're going to do is seal up that space in there with some color match caulk and then we'll be good to go. The one last finishing touch um, beyond the window stuff is I'd mention this. These little pads, if you don't use them on this door, you should keep them because they're very handy on other doors around your house. What they are is little pads that kick out these weather seals down on the bottom. So if you see daylight, you just remove the sticker and you pull this out, put that little wedge in there and it'll take up the daylight in there. And this pad is for this as well. Now I don't use them on every door because they're not necessary on every door. Um, if they're not necessary, then don't put it in because it's just something that's going to get in the way. But if you've got a little bit of daylight there, you can stick those pads in and they will give you a good seal. Sometimes, sometimes the bottom corner is what really needs it. Sometimes the top corner is what really needs it. They work everywhere. Most of the new doors now will give you two. All right, these, this is customer removal, so I would not normally be doing this. <laughs> but the way to get this off, it's got this little 3M tab. You kind of pull. <coughs> and that comes. Now, I mentioned before that there's three magnets in here, and there's three magnets in this little casing right here. And you just push up to make that go. Sometimes this thing will get caught in here. Like one side will just get caught. You just shake it to get it. See, I got one right there that's kind of messed up. You just go up and down. They're pretty, there you go. Just kind of shake it around and it'll work. When it's up, you just go a little bit to open and close it and a lot to open it all the way. These are just beveled little things that fill these holes. When you put them in there, you just kind of want to make sure the bevel's in the right spot. And it, it does take a little bit of a, a knack to get it in there. And you might have sore thumbs when you're done. Oh, that one went right in and the first one was kind of hard. Why don't they come pre put in from the factory? That's a good question. <laughs> so they don't have to do it. Yeah, that, that, that's actually my guess, is they probably just don't want to do it. Is there ever a time you would need to take out the window? For yeah, if you ever, you can, you can just replace this. You can just order this. Like, it's a really good idea. If your door seals perfectly, you just want a fancier door, and you already have glass in your door, you can just pull the glass out, and you can order a fancier, nicer piece of glass and just put that in there, and that'll come with this plastic piece and the holes and the screws, or the hole fillers and the screws and all that stuff. And the way, if you ever do end up changing out your insert, and every once in a while, I will have a customer, um, I just had one, well, within the last seven months or so, who ordered actually the other door that you got, but they, they wanted the blinds and the glass, and what they did was they ordered the cheaper door and then they ordered blinds in the glass and they just had me swap it out on site and they saved money. 
And when you do that, if you do the uh, insert switch, the way that you get these out is you uh, take a, like a three inch screw and just kind of screw into it gently. And you'll destroy the whole filler, but you don't mess anything else up. That's really the only way to get them out. Well, the only way without screwing up the plastic. On an interior install, I would go through and caulk white all along here. I'd fill all of these nail holes, probably caulk along there if it needs it, depending on what's there, and just really caulk everything to make it look pretty. Since we have plywood walls, there's not much of a reason to do that in this particular application. But other than that, we're done. All right, so Mark got this door installed. It was pretty easy. Mm -hmm. How long does this generally take in a normal house? Two hours. Two hours, that's pretty much, mm -hmm. no matter what door it is, is about a two hour job. After you've done it for 16 years. Absolutely. Yeah. And the cost of installing a door like this, having you come out, uh, general you, price range of a, a contractor coming out and do that. Usually in a range of $200. $200, mm -hmm. all right. Well, this, this turned out really nice. It opens and closes really nice. It's also a really good way to add a window uh, to a place when you don't have an option to put a window in there. So this will light up the shop a whole lot. So thanks, Mark. Uh, if you're in the local Searcy area and you want to contact Mark, you can come through me and I'll get him to you, or you can find him at Mark Bates Contracting uh, on Instagram and then Mark Bates Contracting at gmail.com. Yep. That's right. All right, thanks for watching this one. We got the door installed. Next up, we're going to get the paint done. And then finally, we can move into the shop after we do the floors, too. So there's a lot more coming still. Mm. So stay tuned. Thanks for watching. Yeah. Got some ants. Got a whole bunch of ants. Bye bye, ants. Ooh. You just sucked up a whole family. <laughs> That's how we do pest control. Suck them up. Yeah, finally working.